Okay, today uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Vladimir uh, Dobrosevich. So, uh, Vlad received his PhD in physics from Boston University in 1988. After spending a number of years as a postdoc in Brown University, University of Maryland, and the Rutgers University, he joined the faculty of Florida State University in 1995 and has served as a director for Kinetic Science Theory Group in the National Height Magnetic Field Laboratory in Tallahassee. Vlad is an American Physical Society Fellow and is well known for his research in disordered and correlated systems. Let's welcome Vlad to give his pre presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Yang. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak about, and today I would like to focus on uh, on a topic where there we have, we have a, a a very simple approximation that we have developed uh, uh, some years ago to treat with basically with fluctuating modular fields, and we are hoping that this can be useful within the framework of modeling alloys from first principles, as well as actually perhaps to get some simple description of the short range chemical order in alloys. So uh, this is some future work, but today I would like to describe what we have done. It's actually very simple, and I'll try to be somewhat pedagogically explain the motivation for this. So, should I uh, yeah, please, um, share please the share, screen? Share your, yeah, not not yet. Share the screen. Okay, so let me share the screen. So, so here we go. Let me uh, start the presentation then. Okay, so this uh, the title of this is uh, EDMFT capture fluctuating charge order as a precursor to Wigner crystallization. EDMFT is a version of DMFT that has been developed to capture some uh, collective field effects, some density fluctuations in materials. And so uh, here is the, uh, the summary of this talk. Uh, uh, first, I would like to explain the experimental motivation, uh, looking at some experiments of uh, poorly conducting, uh, poorly conducting or poorly insulating behavior. And that's somehow related to the crystals. Then I'll try to explain in why in these materials, uh, the ordering temperature where crystallization, or Wigner crystallization comes out is very, very low. And then uh, that above this temperature, there is some unusual uh, transport regime, which you call a pseudo-gap regime. And then I'll like, try to give a physical picture of what happens in this regime. I'll describe some uh, few details of this uh, theoretical method that we would like to use. And then I'd like to show some uh, benchmark comparisons of this uh, analytical approximation to some Monte Carlo simulations. I will just briefly mention at the end how this can be extended to capture quantum effects as well as uh, the effects of disorder. And what I will not be talking today, but what we hope to uh, be working uh, quick uh, soon, uh, especially with Mike Widom, is uh, can we apply this to a chemical, chemical short range order in ours? So um, just one transparency with the list of some references uh, the main motivation for this work is uh, the legendary book by uh, Nebel Mott on metal and swipe transitions. I'll make some comments on that. And there is this paper by Johannes Bermuda and uh, collaborators who was my former student, published uh, in 2011. This is going to be the main subject of today's talk. But this work has, in fact, started earlier by looking at uh, effects of disorder in Coulomb systems and some glassy behavior. Uh, which we worked on this series of papers, and then we realized that this is relevant also without disorder. Uh, also a comment, a similar approach has been used by Chichar and Kotliar around 2000. So, um, so let me start uh, my story from the beginning. And uh, I would like to first say that there is some uh, standard transport behavior that we are very familiar with. If we have metals, we have scattering of impurities or thermal fluctuations like phonons, and as we increase temperature, there is more scattering and the resistivity goes up. This is very familiar to anyone. And similarly, uh, this is so-called Ruder theory. Similarly, if we have insulators, uh, we have a, a gap in the spectrum and we have to overcome this gap thermally. We have activation and the resistivity at low temperature goes up exponentially very strongly. So these are the familiar regimes we all know. But, uh, if we look at some materials, in fact, many modern materials like cuprates um, at poor doping, so you are near an insulating state, but not quite insulating. Uh, one often finds an upturn of the resistivity as shown here on the right panel, uh, but it is a very weak uh, temperature dependence, much weaker than uh, would expect for, for any normal insulator. And there is no uh, accepted uh, standard theoretical picture to describe this process. 
Uh, a similar behavior has been uh, noted, in fact, very early on by Neville Mott in his famous book. Uh, and he uh, talked about various forms of charge order. Uh, he talked about Wigner crystallization in chapter eight, and he also talked about magnetite, which is a ferromagnet below 800 Kelvin, and it undergoes some sort of charge ordering transition where it becomes an insulator with a well-defined gap to excitations below something like 150 Kelvin. But what uh, Mott observed is that before, so here in the in the inset of this panel, you can see the, uh, the conductivity on a linear scale, and you can see that below something like uh, 300 Kelvin, the conductivity starts to drop, and that happens above uh, the charge ordering transition. So uh, Mott speculated that this is uh, some sort of precursor to charge ordering, and so he, he called this a nearly frozen uh, Coulomb liquid. So he didn't have many equations, he didn't have a quantitative description, but he said that this is something very similar to Wigner crystallization. So uh, that has remained an open question for a number of years, and I think a magnetite is still controversial, but it indicated that we should think about this in terms of approaching some charge order, which is very hard to reach. And uh, another set of examples is um, when we uh, think about systems with Wigner crystallization. So now I would like to show you a few examples of uh, experimental systems where people have tried to find Wigner crystals. Of course, one uh, a generalist uh, expects the Wigner crystal to form in a 2D electron gas at very low density as Wigner has predicted. And then Sui in his uh, work, uh, some maybe almost 20 years ago, he tried to uh, look at very clean two dimensional uh, uh, electron systems in, in semiconductors and tried to look at transport at very low densities. And indeed in this panel on the right side, you can see uh, that there, there is a below a certain density of around 10 to the nine Kelvin or so around this density, uh, the resistivity at low temperature does go up. It, it first sight, it looks like an insulator, but if you look more closely, you'll see that over the entire temperature range, it doesn't cover more than an order of magnitude, which is a much weaker temperature dependence than in normal insulators. And in fact, you can see this better if you plot not the resistivity, but if you plot the conductivity shown uh, on the in this right panel. And then you can see that the conductivity, in fact, is nearly linear uh, in a substantial temperature range at, at higher temperatures, which actually spans the Fermi temperature. So the conductivity seems to be decreasing linearly, and that's completely the inverse to the normal metal behavior where the resistivity decreases linearly. Why, what is the origin of this behavior has not been completely clear at all, but then Sui noticed that in the system, you can estimate where is the Fermi temperature, but uh, since you know the electronic density, some classic work on Wigner crystals, at least at the classical limit, tells you uh, what should be the melting temperature for Wigner crystal at that density. And uh, estimates show that uh, in, for this particular case, the, the melting temperature would be uh, around 0.2 Kelvin or less. Quantum effects should further reduce this. And so he says, well, we don't really expect to see a Wigner crystal in this temperature regime. But what this is, it is something like a melted Wigner crystal, since you are already at temperatures which are much lower than the interside Coulomb energy, or the so-called, uh, 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 so they call this the Coulomb energy, uh, which in this case would be around, I believe, around uh, 10 to 100 Kelvin. So this is in a regime where you are above melting, but the interactions are much stronger typically than the uh, thermal energy, and you have a strongly correlated uh, Coulomb system which should display some some strange behavior. So this was sort of in agreement with what Mott said. And the physical picture, how this should, how you should think of this, I uh, flew to a conference, I think it was about 20 years ago. At one point, you know, uh, the conference was in Taiwan, I believe, and we were flying, you know, a shortcut was across the North Pole. And here is a picture of a nearly frozen iceberg. So you see these little patches of frozen ice, but it is really not a completely frozen water. And uh, this is now getting more and more common, fortunately. So uh, this is just an experimental motivation, but now I would like to make some comments about uh, why is it that in these Wigner crystals uh, and similar systems, why do we expect the freezing temperature to be extremely low? So uh, on this uh, diagram, I'm comparing three types of systems. On the left is a standard system like an Ising model uh, on a lattice where you have nearest neighbor 
interactions and not, not long range interactions. And then the transition temperature will be typically of the order of the interaction energy. Here we're expressing the uh, energy scale in the units of the nearest neighbor repulsion. So if you have a lattice with nearest neighbor repulsion, that will uh, undergo charge order at a temperature which is of order one. However, if you have a long range interaction, studies have shown, and I'll show you some examples of this uh, in a minute, uh, that if you have long range interaction, the freezing is confined to much lower temperatures. If you have uh, freezing on a lattice, uh, then uh, you have a temperature which is about 20 times lower than for short range interactions, around 10 to the minus one. And if you have a continuum to the uh, electron system, uh, the, the, the melting temperature is even lower. It's about 10 to the minus two or 1% of the Coulomb energy. So this is a very, very small energy scale. And that means that if you go to temperature, which is slightly above this melting temperature, um, your thermal energy is much smaller than the repulsion between uh, the neighboring electrons. And so that means that it's very difficult for the electrons to get together and to approach each other because they just don't have enough thermal energy to do so. So uh, this is an unusual situation. And uh, what, uh, what we discovered as a, as a concept that's very uh, useful to understand this behavior is the concept of geometric frustration. So many people have heard that if we have lattices which, are, uh, which have a specific form such that there are competing interactions which make the ordering more difficult. They call this geometric frustration. And that's pretty common in systems like spin ices and, and so forth. Now I'd like to make the uh, analogy to these systems by actually a, a well-known mapping between this lattice gas model where the occupation is zero and one on a given site to an Ising model that has spin variable plus or minus one. So uh, in this language, you can rewrite the uh, Coulomb uh, uh, interaction Hamiltonian in this form, it becomes an antiferromagnetic Ising model, but the interaction in this model uh, depends as one over the distance between sites. So it's a long range antiferromagnet. And so if you look in real space, you'll see that in the antiferromagnet means that the spins on neighboring sites would like to anti-align. In the uh, Coulomb language, this means that if the first site is occupied, then the neighboring sites would like to be empty. This is what repulsion likes to do for you. But in addition to this, you have repulsion between the first site and the, and the third site, which again would like to anti-align. And you can see that the competition between the first uh, uh, nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor interaction is making ordering difficult. If we only have nearest neighbor interaction, then the spins will align up, down, up, down, or in on the Coulomb language, you have occupied empty, occupied empty, you have a checkerboard pattern. But because we have a second order, Sec, uh, second neighbor and further interactions, which decay slowly in space, then there are a lot of competing interactions. And this is the main result why the ordering is difficult to achieve in these in this Coulomb systems. So in, again, uh, we claim, or, or we have discovered that uh, the fact that we have long range interactions with repulsion is effectively creating geometric frustration. And the net result of this is that uh, the transition temperature can in typical cases, be much lower than the neighboring nearest neighbor interaction energy. So, given given this argument, now we'd like to uh, ask: Well, what will happen? Can, how can we think of the in physical terms of the regime where we are above the melting temperature, but at sufficiently low temperatures that the thermal energy is much smaller than the interaction energy? So, uh, this situation is relatively analogous to what you have in a standard Polaron picture. So in a Polaron picture, you imagine you have a charge sitting at this center at this uh, red, red, this is, let's say a positive charge. And then it's embedded in the lattice, which consists of positive and negative ions. And so the, the, if you have a positive charge at the center, the negative ions will be attracted, but the positive ions will be repelled and the lattice will be formed in such a way on the right, uh, right panel, you see how the potential energy is modified due to this deformation. And indeed, this effect will simply create a potential well, shown here in the in, in, in orange, that is deeper than, than without a deformation and an electron can self-trap itself. Well, something very similar happens if you are a, a, a dense liquid where a particle, uh, so you only have repulsive interactions in this case. Uh, and when you place a particle at some point in space, it tends to push away uh, other particles and some empty space is left. And because of uh, the neutralizing background, 
This means that you're actually bringing the positive charge as screening cloud around the particle. So this is an extreme version of screening, which says that basically surrounding the particle, there is a hole. And some people in semiconductor physics, they call this the correlation hole. And so uh, that, in other words, it means that if you want to move the particle, this correlation hole will move with the particle. And um, in, so in order to move, uh, some particles have to come out, uh, uh, out of your way uh, if you want to move the particle at all. And it is much more difficult to, uh, to move. Uh, physically, this happens if you have a crowd. This is an actual picture from my home country, from Belgrade, where in the year 2000, we had one of those orange revolutions where the government was toppled and about a million people came in the streets. Imagine you find yourself in this crowd. How are you going to move and go home when your legs get tired? Well, you can't move around unless someone moves out of your way. So in some, in some sense, it's very similar in these dense liquids. Um, you can only move uh, in a correlated fashion if someone else is moving, and then because of this reason, we have some very viscous moment, some very viscous uh, kinetics, uh, where because the number of moves is significantly decreased because of these strong neighboring correlations. So this is basically the physical picture of what we would like to do. And now uh, I would like to uh, uh, give you some details of uh, how can we have a theoretical approach, which happens as it happens, is uh, able to uh, capture this physics, both the fact that uh, in presence of frustrating long range interactions, both the fact that the transition temperature where charge ordering uh, occurs is significantly uh, lowered, and the fact that there emerges an intermediate transport regime where uh, electrons are basically very strongly correlated with each other in the sense that uh, it behaves like a dense liquid with a relatively high viscosity. And this is why, as you lower the temperature, the resistivity goes up. Uh, the physical picture of this is something that should be familiar to everyone who has uh, used the so-called DMFT methods. And the idea is the following, that uh, if you try to solve a lattice problem, uh, you can do a certain approximation, which amounts to uh, summing a, a certain set of diagrams. And in this case, we are only uh, summing local diagrams for the scattering probability. So uh, in the case of Hubbard model or DMFT, they have a Hubbard model on a lattice. And then the problem is mapped to a single side problem where we have interactions of two electrons be, uh, found on the same, in the same lattice point. But the environment of this site is replaced by an effective medium uh, where, which is basically a, uh, uh, a free electron bath with the renormalized modified spectrum. And the self energy or the, which describes how the spectrum is renormalized is self consistently determined. So this is a pretty well known. Uh, it's a standard approach, but uh, uh, in the standard approaches of DMFT, the original form of DMFT, they were thinking about uh, a site and a fermionic bath consisting of uh, free fermions with renormalized dispersion. A uh, few years later, after DMFT was discovered in the early 90s, some years later, people start, start to think about, well, how about the inter-site interactions and the fact that there are collective modes uh, also existing in the system, which can describe some bosonic excitations. I think one of the first applications was by Gabi Koltyar, who considered a long-range Coulomb interactions near the, the mode transition with Chitra around 2000, but Chi Miao Si also used the same similar ideas to discuss the behavior of, uh, of Anderson lattice models or, or condo lattice models or heavy fermion systems where the inter interactions can cause magnets. In both cases, there is a certain collective mode which can be either uh, some uh, uh, charge density fluctuation or plasma, plasma, or, or plasma oscillations. It can be spin waves if you are talking about a magnetic order or uh, if you have a deformable lattice that is can be the photons. So in each case, there is a, some collective mode, some uh, propagating bosonic excitations in the environment. And you are trying to, uh, to ask a question, how is that modifying the physics of your problem? Um, so in, this, in today's uh, presentation, I would like to focus on a very simple example where we, uh, in fact, only look at classical models and uh, classical models that describe some ordering transition. The simplest example is, of course, the Ising model of a ferromagnet where you have the 
interactions uh, gij between between different sites and uh, they tend to align the spins and, and make the system ferromagnetic. So in this case, uh, you can think of the uh, collective mode as representing uh, uh, spin fluctuations or uh, the fluctuations of the magnetization. And the idea is to replace this by, uh, uh, you describe it as collective modes, uh, which are freely propagating. So in some sense, it's like spin waves, uh, non-interacting spin waves with a renormalized dispersion. And I would like to now show you, explain how this uh, simple physical idea or this program can be easily implemented if you consider the simplest model, like an Ising model. And as I mentioned before, this is uh, very similar to the lattice gas model that we are really interested in, where the occupation can be zero and one on the lattice, and uh, then you add the Coulomb interaction. So, uh, so our idea here is to start with the Ising Hamiltonian, as shown here, uh, uh, on this first formula line. Uh, and then uh, you can, as it turns out for technical simplicity, it turns out that it's useful to replace these uh, hard spins, Ising spins, which can uh, assume values plus or minus one. You can replace it by a soft spin, uh, phi, uh, such which is a continuous variable, but the expectation value of the, of the soft spin would again uh, be correspond to the magnetization. And this soft spin model is given in the next line here by this uh, action, which looks like what some people call the phi four theory. There is a quadratic uh, term which describes the interactions between sides. There is an external field term and there is a nonlinear term uh, uh, proportional to phi to the fourth, which uh, Basically limits the amplitude of the of the of the magnetization, and uh, what is really nice uh, in this representation is that if you take the limit where this coefficient r goes to uh, minus infinity and the coefficient u goes to plus infinity, such that their ratio is equal to minus one, then you can recover the standardizing model. So this is somehow a mathematical trick to make your algebra a little simpler. And then um, this is very similar to uh, fluctuating lambda Ginzburg theories that everyone is, I guess, many people are familiar with. The free energy can be written as an integral over this continuous variable phi on each lattice site. Uh, and here's the partition function. And the free energy is the logarithm of this partition function. Uh, the, the local magnetization will be simply the expectation value of this field phi with respect to this partition function. And the spin-spin correlation functions, G, this is a notation uh, for Green's functions, but this is just the spin-spin correlation function is given as a second cumulant of the, of the field phi. So this is something very familiar and simple. And now, uh, if we ignored the, the, the so-called interaction term phi to the fourth, so if you have a simply a Gaussian theory where the quadratic Hamiltonian, then uh, the... Uh, we get the following equations relating the, the, the external field and the and the local magnetizations. Uh, and because it's a Gaussian integral, we can compute this partition function explicitly, and we find this kind of relation between the field and the magnetization. And the second order, the second cumulant, which is the, the uh, density, density correlation function, takes the standard uh, ornstein zernike form. Like, uh, now, because, again, let me repeat that here uh, we have not only the quadratic Hamiltonian, but we have the quartic term, uh, which is needed to recover the spin limit. Because of this extra term, if we uh, perturbatively or in any way uh, treat the effects of this non-linear, non-quadratic coupling, phi to the fourth term, then uh, the parameters in the Hamiltonian can be renormalized, and in particular this uh, uh, external field is replaced by is is corrected by the certain self energy sigma m and the parameter r which which is related to transition temperature uh, is also renormalized by another self energy sigma r so uh, this is standard diagrammatics that you can do within the, this phi four theory but uh, what we would like to do here is to put forward a self consistent approximation which amounts to uh, stating that we are summing only the diagrams where the self-energy sigma r is purely local. The other self-energy was always local, but sigma r is not generally local. There are terms which are non-local, but we say let's now uh, 
focus on this uh, on an approximation where we only sum all the terms up to infinite order, which produce a local self energy. So this is a philosophy very similar, or almost identical to a standard DMFT. And if you do this, then as Gabi Quartley, I think first realized, you can reduce the problem to a single side problem in an external field. Now, the difference here is that uh, as opposed to standard mean field theory, where you're replacing the environment just with an average field, here, this will be replaced by harmonic medium, which is, a, you can think of it as a set of harmonic oscillators. And that means that at final temperature, this internal field that's produced, uh, that's, that's affecting the given site, will be a fluctuating field with a certain distribution function, uh, which depends on temperature and other parameters. So this should be fairly familiar with people in this community, in the mass community, because we've been work, doing a lot of work, uh, especially recently on uh, looking at statistics of internal uh, modeling fields that we experience on a given site. So uh, we are trying to do this. And in fact, the LSMS simulations can directly compute these modeling fields. Here, we are also talking how these fields, fluctuating fields will not fluctuate only because of disorder, but even without disorder, if you have finite temperature, there are some, some thermal fluctuation of these model fields, and we would like to calculate that. That, of course, can be done for any model. Here, I'm just giving an example of the Ising model. And then, uh, so then uh, when we introduce these corrections, we can write down the local uh, magnetic field uh, with this in this corrected form involving these two self energies, and the same thing for the renormalized uh, Green's function, which represents the density density correlations. And finally, uh, you have to. Uh, uh, impose a self consistency condition saying that if we cal calculate the local magnetization or the local uh, uh, autocorrelation function, then uh, you can do it from a single site model, the impurity model embedded in this harmonic, harmonic approximation, and you get the following set of equations which close the self consistency loops. So uh, if we then uh, uh, take this hard spin limit. We want to recover the Ising model, and we let R. So R and U are just parameters in this in this equation. So we let R go to infinity, and you go to uh, R to minus infinity, or U to plus infinity, with the ratio being minus one. Uh, then the field phi reduces to the spin variable plus or minus one, and uh, the local Green's function is just one minus magnetization square. And we obtain the following equation that it will be familiar to anyone who. Uh, who has used uh, Bragg-Williams or standard mean field theory. You see here the magnetization is a tangent hyperbolic uh, of, uh, uh, and what you, within the tangent hyperbolic, you have this internal field. You see, this is the internal field, uh, which comes from the neighboring magnetizations. Yes? Hello? Is there a question? Uh, no, no, no question. Okay. So I can hear something saying I, I can't. I somehow I can't see you because I turned on this presentation. Uh, so please interrupt me at any time with questions if you if something is not clear. Okay. So uh, we have this uh, first term which represents the internal field coming from the neighboring sites, but uh, and and here is the external field HI. But in addition to this, we have this term minus delta mi. And this term says that if the spin is up, then the local magnetization surrounding the site will be, will be uh, modified uh, in one way, and if the spin is down, in, in the opposite way. So this is basically what in statistical mechanics people call the Onsager reaction term. And in the case of electrostatics, this is something very familiar to what Young and Malcolm and other people have used in the past, saying that uh, if you have a charge in a given site, there will be a screening charge in the neighborhood, uh, which will be affected by the charging state on the site. So this is something that is not captured in standard mean field theory, but it's something that exists in reality. And this is the simplest way to capture this term. Uh, so the way that you can physically think of this is that uh, if you have a certain spin pointing in the given direction, it will modify the magnetization of the environment such that it will create a potential well in which the spin or the particle is sitting. So in some sense, this is a, a kind of a polaronic effect, which is very natural in this language because we are replacing the environment by a harmonic model, by a harmonic approximation, which means that basically we have essentially the behavior as if we had a, a, 
a site embedded in a deformable harmonic medium like a set of photons. And just like the uh, case of small polaron, if you put a particle in a harmonic medium, you will the medium will sag. It's like sitting a heavy person sitting on, a, on an old mattress. The mattress will sag to create a potential well in which the particle will be trapped. So this polaronic effect is directly captured in this in this approximation because we are using this harmonic approximation for the environment. And so you get these two set of equations in the case of, uh, uh, this is the self-consistent equation for the magnetization and the self-consistent equation for the uh, for the Green's function is given by the by this equation. You can uh, also directly use the same method for the uh, Coulomb problem, where we have the interaction Vij. We can choose this interaction to be anything we like uh, uh, between particles on site I and J, and there is an external electrostatic potential acting on these sites. So you repeat the same steps, and you get the self consistent equation, uh, which determines this parameter delta. So this parameter, so, so the thing in bracket in this uh, expression here uh, under this uh, the momentum sum, this is the momentum dependent density density correlation function. And as you can see, basically what it does, it just modifies, here's the Coulomb potential and the, the other term here on the left, it is basically related to the screening length. So what this field delta, this so-called cavity field, what it does, uh, it describes the deformation of the environment uh, which is found when you place a particle in a medium which responds. So this is, you can call it an electronic polaron effect. And this effect will, what it does, it will modify the transition temperature, but it will also uh, basically modify the screening length. And this kind of momentum sum. So this is a simple equation which involves only one integral. This is a momentum integral. But if because of the momentum enters only through the form of V of Q, you can introduce the density of these collective modes given by this expression nu of epsilon. And then uh, you can reduce this integral to a single integral over the spectral function. So this is a very simple expression. You can compute the spectral function nu only once. And then as you put different temperatures or different values of the external field, you can solve uh, this algebraic equation just by doing a single integral, which is super easy. So uh, this sounds like a lot of words and a lot of formulas, but now I would like to show you some results uh, of this approximation for a simple problem where we have uh, considered uh, a hypercubic lattice at half filling. So that means that every other site is occupied and we turn on the Coulomb repulsion between particles. And so at in the ground state, uh, these particles would like to stay as far as they can from each other and uh, they form a checkerboard pattern. Now, uh, the first version of this calculation was done uh, with a standard Coulomb interaction one over R. But uh, when we were, my postdoc was giving this talk here in our laboratory, one of the, one of our colleagues, Kunyang, asked a question, what will happen if we change the exponent alpha, describing the, the range of the interactions and how will the results be modified? This was a very insightful question. And now in this paper that was published in 2011, we have considered a family of models where the interaction can have a, have a form uh, one over R to the exponent alpha. If alpha is one, we get a Coulomb interaction. If alpha is very large, then we essentially only get a short range interaction. But if alpha is very small, then the interactions become longer and longer in range. And the first result that we have obtained is shown in this nice phase diagram to the right. So uh, the the blue line is the transition temperature where this checkerboard order kicks in at low temperature as a function of the exponent alpha. So you see when alpha is larger than the dimension D, then uh, this uh, transition temperature approaches the, the dashed line here on top is the, uh, uh, the transition temperature for the short range model, which in fact is mathematically identical to an Ising model with antithermogenic interactions. And in, in, the, in two dimensions, in three dimensions, this transition temperature is known to be around two. So you can see here uh, that uh, when an exponent alpha is, is, is large, so you have short range interactions, we recover the non-transition temperature of, of an icing model. But if we uh, now uh, reduce the exponent alpha and it becomes smaller than the dimension D, and this is true in all dimensions, uh, larger than two, two and, two and higher, then the transition temperature is significantly decreased. So you see one exponent, alpha is one, then transition temperature 
is more than an order of magnitude lower. And this is the result of the geometric frustration I was describing. But in fact, this effect becomes even more pronounced when alpha is smaller and smaller. And this is simply because when alpha goes to zero, then you have the infinite range of antiferromagnetic interactions. All the spins would like to anti-align with each other. And this is impossible if you have infinite range interactions. And so the transition temperature has to vanish. And indeed, we see, we find that the transition temperature vanishes linearly with the exponent alpha. Uh, and this is a result that we have obtained from this analytical approximation. But uh, with the help of our colleague, uh, Stratus Monosakis uh, at FSU, uh, he helped my student, Johannes, uh, to uh, perform some uh, classical Monte Carlo calculations, which can be done very accurately using u summation methods. And uh, the dots here, the, these blue dots, are the results from the transition temperature from Monte Carlo. And as you can see, it exactly follows the analytical curve. But there is another interesting uh, feature here. And this is the green line, which shows what the simplest mean field theory, which uh, in the Coulomb case is, uh, or in the quantum case would be the so-called random phase approximation or, or hard tree self-consistent hard tree approximation. Uh, this uh, approximation standard mean field theory will give you a transition temperature uh, given by the green line, which is much, much higher and remains finite even when alpha goes to zero. And what you find is that be below this mean field transition temperature, and the actual transition temperature, when alpha is smaller, including the Coulomb case, there arises a relatively broad uh, intermediate regime where the system is not ordered, but the uh, thermal energy is much smaller than the interaction energy. And so you'll find what I what you described as a pseudo-gap regime, which has very unusual properties. And what was this physics that was really not understood before became very clear for the combination of Monte Carlo and this analytical techniques. So now I would like to uh, uh, saying uh, show, showing you here uh, that uh, in fact, at least for the phase diagram, this analytical approximation is very accurate compared to Monte Carlo. And it's actually very simple. It's a single algebraic equation that you have to solve. Now I would like to show this, uh, define, uh, say a few features about the technical details. So um, the density density correlation function chi of, chi of k is given by the standard uh, uh, ornstein zernike form. Uh, where you have the interaction of V of K, and then on the left, you have a constant four plus D, where this uh, this uh, uh, parameter D is related to the self-energy that we self-consistently determine is, a temp is, is something that depends on temperature or the magnetic field, and but it's just a number independent of K. And uh, in this orson zerniki form, it defines essentially what is the screening length of the system. Uh, the self-consistent condition from which D is calculated is extremely simple. You see it's given by this one integral over the spectral functions and uh, the density correlator. And you just have to solve this one integral uh, analytically or numerically given the form of the plasma spectrum. And what's interesting to look at what this plasma spectrum looks like as this exponent alpha uh, uh, changes. So as I mentioned, the exponent alpha, its meaning is the, it controls the range of the interactions when alpha is small, Interactions are very long in range. Uh, and this basically controls the amount of geometric frustration in the system. And what we find is when alpha becomes very small, then the spectral function nu is extremely, there is a huge peak at very small energy, which corresponds to, as it turns out, the main contribution is from the corner of the brilliant zone, which corresponds to the shear mode of the Coulomb, of the Coulomb system, of the Wigner crystal. And uh, because there is a huge spectral peak at very low energy, uh, this is essentially having a branch of the phonon spectrum with a very small Debye temperature. So once uh, the temperature, when the temperature becomes higher than the characteristic energy of this of this mode, then a large number of these uh, density fluctuations are thermally activated, and this destroys this destroys the order. You can think of this uh, self-consistent condition I've written up here. In some sense, it describes basically, uh, it is physically very closely related to the so-called Lindemann criterion, which says that the order will be destroyed once the amplitude of the vibrations of the thermal fluctuations becomes comparable to the unit cell. So uh, essentially when uh, we find here that the spectral spectrum of excitations has a huge peak at low energy, and so when the temperature becomes comparable to that peak, that means that a large number of low energy density fluctuations become active. And then the Lindemann criterion tells us that the 
uh, that the uh, system has to melt. In fact, you can show that in when alpha becomes very small, the spectrum approaches some uh, limiting form. And so for small alpha, all the spectra can be uh, can be collapsed on a universal uh, way by scaling with alpha. And we can analytically show that in fact, in that limit, which includes the Coulomb case one, uh, this entire range is described by the scaling regime that the transition temperature is proportional to the exponent alpha. So when the range of interactions go to zero, transition goes linearly to zero. So um, what about the pseudo gap? Well, the pseudo gap uh, that I talked about can be defined in the following way. I think everyone in this collaboration is familiar with these modeling fields, which say basically, if we know the density uh, on different lattice sites, we can multiply the density by the Coulomb interaction and sum over all the densities that says that we are basically computing the electrostatic potential on a given site coming from all the other sites. And if we have a non-uniform distribution, then we'll get the distribution of these modeling fields acting on a given site. And you have to know its statistics, the histogram of these modeling fields. In a random system at zero temperature, uh, they fluctuate from site to site because the system is random. In a uniform system at finite temperature, there are thermal fluctuations of the density. And for the same reason, the modeling fields will display thermal fluctuations. So what you have to do is to, uh, so this delta function says that, okay, let's uh, uh, look at the probability that the modeling field has a particular value. And then we perform a thermal average. So this so-called density of states uh, is in fact, nothing other than the histogram of these fluctuating, thermally fluctuating modeling fields. So what does it do? Well, uh, the analytical solution tells us that it is generally in this approximation can be represented as a superposition of two Gaussians, which are shifted from each other by essentially the Coulomb energy. But this parameter D that was determining the screening length, that parameter D is a strong function of temperature. And at, at high temperature, these Gaussians broaden and they merge, whereas at low temperature, they become very narrow. And that's when the pseudo gap opens. So on the right panel, you see uh, this uh, histogram of these modeling fields uh, shown for different temperatures. At high temperature, both uh, Gaussians are very broad and they merge essentially into one Gaussian. And the uh, uh, the red line is the result of EDMFT, analytical result, uh, just uh, in terms of two Gaussians. Uh, Monte Carlo is shown by dash line. You can see very good agreement. And even uh, self-consistent Gaussian approximation, which is a simpler version than EDMFT, uh, uh, this is something like uh, like a mean spherical approximation for some people who are familiar with that. Or uh, in, in classical electrostatics, it's called the Debye-Huckel approximation. That approximation also gives a good agreement at high temperature. But what's very interesting that we can now go to low temperature and the lowest temperature shown here is 0.03. Uh, this was done for the version of the model where alpha is 0.3. So we have fairly long range interactions. Then. Uh, uh, this temperature is just slightly above the melting temperature. And you already see here that these modeling fields now have a distinct uh, two peak structure with a gap in between. And we find really good agreement between the analytical theory in red and the Monte Carlo data in blue. But the, uh, the, the Bach-Huckel theory, which is a simple Gaussian theory, completely fails to find uh, uh, the opening of the pseudo gap. And uh, uh, this is shown even more clearly on the bottom panel where you plot the value of the of this histogram at zero in the uh, at the Fermi energy uh, as a function of temperature. And you see the uh, red line is EDMFT, the blue dots are Monte Carlo. You see they're really on top of each other, this, describing very accurately how the spectral gap opens. And uh, the the uh, the, uh, the Bayh-Huckel theory, or what you can call classical limit of RPA, that approximation badly fails. It completely fails to describe pseudo gap opening. So this is actually very interesting because uh, when you have this gap opening, you can immediately guess, and I'll show you results in a minute. You can immediately guess that the number of thermal accessible states for transport is dramatically reduced. And therefore the, the kinetics has to slow down. So uh, in short, this analytical approximation identifies a new regime where uh, a gap in the distribution of modeling field opens up. And uh, uh, this is completely understood in this regime as a sort of polaronic effect where you say, well, 
when the thermal energy is much smaller than the Coulomb energy, the particle is really uh, uh, digging uh, a potential well for itself by pushing other particles out of the way. This correlation hole moves with the particle. So it's a very strongly correlated motion. That This, uh, this physics restricts uh, dramatically the number of uh, thermally allowed configurations. And this is why the kinetics is, uh, is dramatically slowed down. What is to me was a huge surprise is that this extremely simple analytical theory uh, captures this effect, but it does so because we are doing a harmonic approximation for the environment. Therefore, we can we have direct analogy with a particle interacting with a deformable uh, elastic medium in the polar run theory. And this correlation hole that forms in a Coulomb liquid, it can be described and it has been described by people in the literature as an electronic polar run. So now I just like at the end to mention a couple of uh, 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 extensions of this of this method. One is that uh, you can repeat the same calculation if you, in addition to the Coulomb interaction, shows on the right here, you also have quantum hopping so that you can take a tight binding model with long range Coulomb interactions. And then I repeated the same procedure. You can replace the environment by an effective medium. But now this medium in the quantum case consists of a bosonic medium, bosonic bath, and a fermionic bath. And then the local action has two terms. One is this uh, quadratic term in the fermion operators that are familiar from, say, a CPA or DMFT. And then the second part has a density density correlation that is obtained by integrating out the bosonic bath. It's a retarded interaction and it physically represents the fact that the particle can kick the environment then uh, because the bosons propagate freely in the environment they they come around and they return sometime later to kick back the particle so this is a retarded self interaction uh due to this uh, due, due to the collective mode so uh technically this uh, problem this type of action this impurity model is called the bose fermi condo model but this is actually a charged quantum quantum model we don't have spin degrees of freedom but still it's uh it's a quantum impurity model that is not easy to solve. There are currently uh, quantum Monte Carlo uh, codes that can tackle this problem, but so far this has not been extensively used. Uh, however, what's interesting is that uh, this uh, uh, quantum calculation can be uh, uh, performed in a simplified way if we go to sufficiently high temperatures where we can ignore the time dependence of, of the basically of these internal model fields. And this is a well-known strategy that has been put forward by many people in the past. And you can check where it breaks down. So in the, on this phase diagram, we show the uh, term, uh, the phase diagram of this uh, charge order state, the Wigner lattice Wigner crystal as a function of temperature and the bandwidth. And we see that the Wigner crystal is confined to low temperature and, and, and small Fermi energy. Then there is an intermediate pseudogap phase separating it from the weakly correlated electron system. The semi-classical approximation where we can solve this equation very easily uh, is uh, valid above this green dashed line on the left. And as an example, we uh, look at the trajectory where we uh, have a relatively modest amount of quantum fluctuation. So in, in the semi-classical regime, we lower the temperature and then we uh, cross the solar gap regime before you hit Wigner crystallization. So on the right, we see uh, the conductivity calculated from this theory, uh, as well as from this Monte Carlo calculation. So you see that conductivity initially goes up, there's a maximum, and then it drops down to almost zero. And this large drop is happens, in fact, uh, above the, the, the melting temperature, which is shown by this dash line. So this uh, solar gap regime, uh, is the regime where the gap gradually opens, the number of thermally accessible moves that the electrons can make for in order to uh, carry a current is reduced further and further, and the conductivity drops in a weakly temperature-dependent fashion, not in an activated fashion, but in a pseudo-linear pseudo fashion. And remarkably, this is very similar to the experiment done on, 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 on magnetite. So on the left, you see the uh, experimental results for magnetite. Magnetite becomes ferromagnetic at 858 Kelvin. Then below 300 Kelvin, the conductivity starts to drop dramatically, drops by more than a factor of four before, before the freezing transition happens. And exactly the same uh, uh, kind of behavior is found in our, in our theory where we, where we just looked at the 
semi-classical uh, Coulomb liquid on the lattice. Uh, uh, and uh, this is pretty much uh, what Mott has predicted in his wisdom. He did it in a semi-poetic way, but he had the right physics and the right intuition to claim that this intermediate regime above a modest uh, melting temperature, but before the temperature scale corresponding to the Coulomb energy, that intermediate sewer gap regime is a strongly correlated, almost frozen Coulomb liquid. Uh, as a final comment, I would like to say that, in fact, historically, uh, I, I started to work on a version of this problem with this order, and then uh, the electrons, rather than forming a checkerboard periodic pattern at low temperature, they uh, will freeze in a random pattern when this order is sufficiently strong, and as it turns out, there are actually many metastable states in this case, and people describe this regime as a Coulomb glass. Um, so we developed, using the same EDMFT methods, a classical theory for this Coulomb liquid, uh, so disordered Coulomb liquid, in the 2005 PRL paper with Sergei Pankov, who developed much of this technology. And uh, the phase diagram is shown on the right. You can see when this order is sufficiently strong at low temperature, um, uh, the... Uh, uh, electron fluid freezes below a certain uh, uh, glass transition temperature, but at weak, at a sufficiently weak, weak disorder, it this is this uh, glassy or amorphous state is replaced by a periodic finger crystal. It's interesting to show to see that the screening length, uh, which we can calculate from the self consistent self energy of plasmons, the screening length basically uh, uh, remains very short in this entire pseudo gap regime. And that simply means that when you have a physical picture of the correlation hole, you have a particle on a given site, and then because the thermal energy is much smaller than the nearest neighbor repulsion, the neighboring sites are essentially empty. You have a very small occupation probability, and that uh, correlation hole is an extremely strong version of the screening cloud. So the point is that uh, this theory, which we call nonlinear screening theory, because it is actually allows for the density fluctuations due to the screening to not, they are not small like in linear screening theory, but here they can be of order one. So it's a nonlinear screening theory that properly describes the formation of the screening cloud. And nevertheless, even though the interaction is screened strongly at low temperature, nevertheless, the system can freeze at temperatures which are much, much smaller than the, uh, than, than uh, what you have in the nearest neighbor case. So this is kind of paradoxical and comes as a surprise to many people. You think that if the screening length is of order one lattice spacing, then all the physical quantities will behave as if you only had short range interactions. This uh, example, uh, simple a lattice model of, of a lattice gas model of particles, spinless particles on the lattice interacting through long range Coulomb interactions, which we basically solved in the semi-classical limit, essentially exactly through Monte Carlo and through this analytical approximation, it shows that when you have long range interaction, this geometric frustration uh, is very powerful and it pushes the transition temperature to, to be very low, uh, such that an intermediate pseudo gap regime, which is a strongly correlated a Coulomb liquid regime emerges and uh, it has very, very unusual properties in the sense that it has very poor uh, viscosity, a very poor uh, uh, conductivity, high viscosity, and essentially as you lower the temperature, the pseudo gap further opens and the resistivity goes up and up as is seen in number of experiments and also in this theory. I would like to just mention a few other things. Uh, this theory in presence of disorder is fairly complicated and deep so, uh, in, within this glassy phase, which quantitatively is very small. Uh, there is also a metastability, many metastable sets emerging, and, and one has to use what is an extension of the so-called Parisi theory for spin glasses, a uh, technically very complicated theoretical method, but it can describe remarkably uh, the so-called uh, 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 universal Efrosklovsky gap. Efrosklovsky have predicted that for this random system, uh, the distribution of atom fields will follow, have a universal power law form at low energy, with exponents that depend on dimensionality D and the uh, interaction range alpha, uh, in interaction parameter alpha. And uh, using this replica symmetry breaking theory, we were able to, in fact, uh, completely re, uh, reproduce these exponents and the, in other words, their dependence on D and alpha as predicted in the heuristic way by Fruskowski and seen in 
numerous simulations. So this is just a comment uh, that there are numerous extensions of this theory and uh, we hope to be able to use it for various problems. Uh, I personally ha have been quite stimulated uh, in this, uh, within this must uh, uh, collaboration because I started to realize that uh, many more uh, possible extensions or, or applications of this idea can be perhaps useful. So what I would like to summarize with and to just say that uh, we have a very, very simple description for density fluctuations in, of the Coulomb liquid. Uh, this is something that technically we can call it extended di dynamical mean field theory, but in the semi-classical regime, it is extremely simplistic. Uh, it is numerically almost uh, cost-free, but it is extremely accurate. I was personally very surprised how accurate this is as we really tried very hard to benchmark this theory against Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, so what we do find is that uh, uh, as a result of this uh, frustration coming from long range interactions, uh, the transition temperature to periodic order, periodic charge order is pushed to low temperatures. And then there is an intermediate regime that emerges uh, above the melting temperature, but below the Coulomb energy scale. The pseudo gap regime uh, is uh, very unusual, but it explains in some uh, surprising detail, some many experiments that have been uh, achieved over the years. And uh, and also, you can really describe the statistics of these modeling fields relatively accurately uh, as compared to Monte Carlo uh, calculations. Uh, the way to think about this is that uh, if you have various competing interactions, uh, different types of orders can emerge. And sometimes these orders are incompatible with each other. When that happens, then uh, none of the orders can win. Uh, the uh, At very low temperatures, one of them will win, but at intermediate energy scales. You will find, uh, in fact, rather than a static order, you will find flu fluctuating order. Uh, there is a strong uh, connection between these fluctuating uh, modeling fields at intermediate temperatures and the formation of this electronic polaron or the correlation hole uh, which is basically the mechanism how the pseudo gap opens. Uh, I believe that in this very simple example that I've given you, we understand pretty much everything. But of course, in real life, since, uh, the world is much more complicated and uh, there could be various other uh, systems uh, or regimes where perhaps the same strategy could be uh, useful. One of them that I've only recently came to my attention is something that Mike Widom has done a lot of work on and very successfully describing the fact that in alloys at uh, elevated temperatures of what you say a thousand Kelvin, atoms uh, of different chemical species can uh, swap around and move around. So there is some thermal motion in this alloy. Uh, this is a regime where you don't have any periodic order. In fact, this, we, we, we would like to add uh, uh, focus on these regimes because we like homogeneous alloys, but there is some temperature dependence to these fluctuations. And in addition to just randomly placing atoms, we have some degree of chemical short range order. Uh, this is basically describing the tendency to form a certain crystalline orders, but these orders maybe are not fully realized. So instead of a, a long range order, we have fluctuating orders. This is an important element in modeling alloys because it will modify the statistics of these internal fields and that in turn uh, modifies all, pro all physical properties of an alloy. Um, there's another uh, related issue which perhaps can also be tackled using this approach and that is that uh, in addition to just considering how uh, uh, what kind of chemical short range order you have you can also ask for a given configuration of low temperature uh, modeling fields have a certain distribution that can fluctuate in space and in time. At finite temperature, there is some thermal fluctuation. At zero temperature, there is a fluctuation due to disorder. And you would like to understand these statistics. We have taken first steps within this collaboration to do so in metals, where uh, perturbative methods prove to be sufficient. But if we move away from, uh, from good metals with good screening to poor metals with poor screening or even insulators, then uh, these modeling fields will become even stronger. Their statistics more unusual and we'll, we may need more powerful methods, not perturbative methods, but more powerful methods to describe them in a semi-analytical fashion. And this is one of the 
over our overarching goals of this collaboration is to do both uh, large scale uh, supercell uh, first principle calculations like LSMS, but also uh, try to develop a simplified methods like KKRCPA uh, to try to see if we can take a, some shortcut in order to scan the enormous phase space of these alloys uh, effectively. Uh, the existing KKRCPA is a very powerful method that's been around for a long time, but it has certain limitations. And the limitation is that the environment of each site is replaced by some uniform medium. So basically you cannot uh, capture the fluctuating metal fields. Uh, I believe that uh, by extending slightly this KKRCPA method through this EDMFT strategy, we will be able to take a first shot at fluctuating model fields uh, in alloys. And I believe that this will be very attractive and profitable direction for future work. So thank you very much for your attention. I will stop here and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Vlad. It's a very nice talk. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, now uh, well, let's open the floor to uh, audience and uh, please questions. Okay, yeah. Hand up. Okay, Go ahead. so a couple of sort of ill posed questions. Okay. So on the quantum. Then, then I warn you, Kanki, I'll give you ill posed answers. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the uh, you showed this quantum extended DMFT version, right? Which has a fermionic yes. path. So it's more more for trying to just understand it. So yes. the, in the normal, uh, in the usual uh, DMFT, you, of course, you have an impurity site, and they can exchange electrons back and forth, uh, yes. and it's a hybridization matrix. Uh, yes. or, uh, okay. So when you have a from so you have a fermionic bath plus a bosonic bath. Is that yes. correct? You have two yes. baths then? Okay, so with That's the fermionic true. bath, I as understand it can exchange electron uh, hybridize in the same way as before. Yes. yes. What happened, what about the bosonic part? How how does that interact with the impurity? That's a very good question. So you see, uh you can think just like you can think of the fermionic bath as if you had a single site and then in real space it's surrounded by free uh, some free fermions with some renormalized uh, spectrum. Uh, so you don't have to look at a local action. So, you know, the local action is obtained by integrating out the fermions. But uh, but you don't have to integrate out the, the, uh, the, the fermions. You can just consider an anti impurity model where you have a site in a given bath. The same thing you can do for the bosonic term. You can think of this as a single site that's embedded in a, in a bath of free fermions. So it's in the simplest example of this would be, say, the Caldera-legged model where you have a two level system interacting with the bath of harmonic oscillators. Now, when this bath is harmonic, when it's quadratic in density fluctuations, so it describes uh, free bosons propagating, then because it's quadratic, you can integrate this out. This is what's done, for example, in the caldera legged model. And then when you integrate out these bosons, you arrive at the second term that I'm showing here in this action, which has a, re a retarded density density interaction, on-site interaction, at time t and time t prime. So this is a retarded interaction obtained by integrating out the bath. So if you, uh, instead of, if you don't integrate the bath, if you leave it in its original form, then because the bath fluctuates, there will be, uh, 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 there will be an internal field which couples the local density uh, uh, with the environment. So basically you can think of this like if I have a, uh, say a bath of harmonic oscillators, the harmonic oscillators fluctuate in time and uh, and dynamically. And then uh, there is an internal field that couples to the two level system. And in this case, it couples to the electronic density uh, and it represents basically the fluctuating Madelung fields, electrostatic fields produced by other electrons, which fluctuate in time. And uh, so this is the total electrostatic potential produced on a given site by the environment but in this approximation, the environment is not static, it is fluctuating, and therefore the Madelung field has some time dependence. It is the sum of all terms coming from all the sites, and it fluctuates in time and in frequency. Uh, so you have to uh, self-consistently determine the dynamics of this environment. And basically, so instead of just being free particles with a given dispersion, there is a certain uh, 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 self-energy for this collective mode. It will be uh, basically, the irreducible uh, density fluctuation of the electron gas, uh, and uh, and therefore the 
uh, when you insert it in the in the free plasmon dispersion, you will it, it will tell you basically how the spectrum of these fluctuating model fields will, will, will be renormalized. But yes, the, this is a very good question. It represents the in, an internal field. In this case, it's an internal electrostatic field produced by the fluctuating environment and acting on the density on the given side. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the, the problem with this is that this quantum action, if you want to solve it fully, it's uh, it's it's a complicated impurity model that uh, requires yeah, yeah. some Monte Carlo or something like that. That's what I was thinking. So uh, I don't know if anybody else has a question. I had another question. I can wait if somebody else wants to ask. Uh, okay, I I have a question. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so in uh, in KGCPA, uh, we can certainly do something uh, to extend uh, by adding the uh, uh, magnetic field. But the question yes. is. This a uh, screening lens. Uh, is that universal, or which is you know usually we do consider a nearest neighbor a screening. Uh, right. Uh, well, what, so, what so is that way to determine the screening lens? Should we yes. Go? Yes. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very good question. So so you know, uh, th th this is the point. Is that well, let me just get to the transparency. Uh, or it's here. Yes. So uh, uh, you see on this diagram, we actually computed the screening length uh, for this model for a particular model microscopically. This is a classical model that we solved in this case, but it also has a screening length that's temperature dependent and becomes a order one in low temperatures. Uh, uh, technically, let me just show you technically where this enters. So you can see this transparency, uh, the sky of K is the density, density correlation function. And it has a form constant plus beta V of K. So uh, this defines the screening length, which is given, it's related to this parameter D. This parameter D is a self consistently determined parameter that says basically how uh, uh, how the how the screening length is self consistently renormalized in this nonlinear theory, and so yes, we can compute the screening length microscopically, and then it will enter directly in the statistics of these modeling fields because we have. So I'm showing here just an expression valid in the classical limit. The quantum case is slightly more complicated. But in the classical case, we have a we have a histogram row of omega and t. This is the histogram of modeling fields, which is parameterized by only one parameter, which is this parameter d, which also defines the screening length. So there is a direct connection between the screening length and the uh, and the statistics of these modeling fields. And and you can see here actually uh, the uh, this uh, uh, result for this uh, for this histogram we have the uh, red is this uh, uh, analytical approximation, and the blue is what we extracted from, from classical Monte Carlo simulations. So you can see it re works reasonably, very, actually very accurately. Yeah, okay. So in principle, we can run big large unicell calculation in Earth's to use this model uh, to determine, to extract the, uh, the string lens, right? Well, you, I think that, the, 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 yes, I mean, one can do it in a, in a SMS, but uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, it, it looks like one should be able to uh, uh, extend a little bit the C, KPRC, uh, KKRCPA, and that's going to be sufficient to, to self-consistently compute the screening length, the histograms of bundle fields and, and, and many other things without actually running the, the, of course, you know, we would like to, Kind of validate this against LSMS. Yeah, yeah. But right. but but the point is that we uh, this is offering a way to uh, uh, to uh, to calculate the same quantities approximately, but in a much simpler and faster method way. Uh, sorry, can I, I just cut in? Uh, go ahead, please. <laughs> Your second question. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I am just so I just had a question about the RPA. So. When you showed uh, one of the earlier curves was you were comparing the Monte Carlo calculation to your yes. EDFT yes. calculation. Yes. There's yes. an RPA calculation which was, but that RPA is a quantum quantum RPA or. Well, uh, so okay, so well, uh, not this one. The other slide where yeah. you had. Yeah. So uh, let me let me time. let me. Uh, yeah. So th there was actually. Uh, uh, yeah, this one. So yes, this, this RPA, one is that so, a quantum so, fully quantum look, uh, RPA? Well, so no. Uh, this model that we, th this phase diagram that we show here is a, is a phase diagram for the classical 
la uh, Coulomb lattice gas model. Mm -hmm. So it's a classical model. Now, if you do lattice RPA for the quantum version of the model, and then you let the quantum hopping go to zero, right? Then RPA will reduce to something, right? And that something is what was what in the literature in the old literature was called the Bayhackel theory. Mm -hmm. So the Bayhackel theory is a classical version of RPA, and it can be applied to this lattice model as well. So if you do this, then you can predict certain quantities, and and you can predict the freezing temperature. It's shown in this green line, and the actual freezing temperature is shown with the blue line. So you can see when the interactions become very long. This classical RPA works very badly for freezing. You will not capture the fact that the freezing temperature can be pushed to, to very low values. But the other thing that it doesn't do, and this is even more important, is that, oops, uh, when you look at the histogram of these Madeleine fields, uh, there is this gap that's opening. And uh, uh, this is an effect that cannot be captured in, in, in any Gaussian theory. So by its nature, RPA is a Gaussian theory. You can think you can do, obtain RPA very generally by a uh, standard way to one of the ways to obtain RPA is to uh, decouple the interaction uh, using a, a, a Gaussian trans Hubbard story transformation. And then uh, at the at the settle point level, you get Hartree Fock. When you, you, when you look at quadratic fluctuations, you get RPA. So this is a Gaussian uh, correction to Hartree Fock. Uh, but that Gaussian theory, which in the classical limit reduces to the well-known de Bayhackel theory, that theory uh, is not able to describe the pseudo gap opening at all. And and most striking is the bottom phase diagram. You see this what we call self-consistent green approximation. This is basically uh, a classical version of RPA applied to the slightest model, oh, okay. and it completely fails to capture the gap opening. Okay, thanks. Sure.